The misanthrope, of my sort anyway, does want people to do the work. It's not a council of despair. It's saying we need to be honest about what we're like if we're going to become better as time goes on. Hey, hey humans. humans! Welcome to Demystifying Science, the hottest show for the coolest earthlings. Yeah! This week we've got a conversation with Dr. Ian James Kidd, a philosopher at the University of Nottingham who studies vices immoral or otherwise corrupting behaviors in humans. The negative effects of vices are far-reaching. Smoking damages your body, anger hurts others, greed breaks down trust, and in general, vices harm you or the people around you. Dr. Kidd's work focuses on developing a robust perspective on all of the terrible things humans do and have done to one another, and misanthropy, the moral condemnation of humans that often follows this realization. And he's pluralized the concept of misanthropy by imagining several gradations of condemnation so that the idea is not restricted to outright hatred. The classical hateful misanthrope, which he calls the enemy type, is just one small subset of the whole. Then there's also the fugitive type misanthropes who choose to run away from human society. And the activist type misanthropes who spend their time working to improve things on a grand scale. And then there's the quiet type misanthropes who gently work to improve their immediate environments. In the end, it would seem that these identities are not exclusionary. Rather, individuals shift between the misanthropic subtypes as they wrestle with what it means to be human in the modern day. Our conversation wandered between the role of intelligence and vice, the erosion of trust in the era of social networks, and the need for radical empathy to get humans back on track. And so much more. We're going to have to catch up with Dr. Kidd again when we get to Earth. Let us know what you think, humans. And don't forget to subscribe and share with your crew. It helps us so much to keep these conversations rolling. Take care, enjoy the show, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Well, hello. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very, very welcome. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. What an experience. So you're an Earth philosopher. I'm one of many Earth philosophers, yes. Oh. Wow. And you're, what kind of a philosopher are you? Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a generalist. Um, philosophy is broadly concerned with trying to understand human life. So uh, it's got to be quite a diverse subject. So I'm interested in good and evil, right and wrong, coping with our mortality, how we should organize our communities, kind of everything. And what kind of misanthrope are you? Well, <laughs> one, uh, one curious feature about uh, human beings as a species is that uh, when we think about ourselves deeply and honestly, some of us come to the conclusion that collectively we're a pretty awful bunch and uh, those people are called misanthropes. So if a, a misanthrope like me, unfortunately, condemns humankind as it's come to be. Um, we think that humankind is just saturated with vices and failings that are so entrenched and so profound that really collectively we've come out pretty badly. Um, and that's the sort of misanthrope that I am. I'm someone who has that appraisal of my species and I'm trying to find ways to cope with it. And you have a classification of types of misanthropes. Is everybody a misanthrope? Well, not everyone is a misanthrope. Um, it's not really a very popular concept um, amongst human beings, and that won't surprise you. Obviously, it's a very difficult position to take seriously that the entirety of the species or the culture that you're a member of is awful. And so it's not really been much thought about seriously by philosophers. Um, not many people would call themselves misanthropes. And if you ask a lot of people on Earth what misanthropy is, they'll usually say it's a hatred of human beings or a, a hatred of humankind. But I think that's a bit narrow. Um, there are misanthropes who hate human beings. For example, uh, there are some eco-misanthropes. They look at the ways that human beings treat animals and the natural world, how much damage we're doing to our planet, the ways we're destroying our ecosystem. And they understandably hate human beings for being so destructive and greedy and violent. But there are plenty of other ways you could be a misanthrope. Um, there are some misanthropes who aren't hateful of human beings. 
they're more afraid of them. They fear human beings. They fear the damage they do. They fear, they fear the corruption you get from living amongst them. And these misanthropes want to flee the human world. They're fugitives from humankind. Hmm. They want to escape the human world to try to find some safe place on a distant island or maybe even on a distant planet, actually. They want to flee the Earth and find some nicer creatures, maybe like yourselves, to live with. So do there's at least two kinds of misanthropy. Do you think that uh, humans domesticate animals, right? We have, yes, for a very, very long time. Do you think that the animals that got domesticated were fugitive misanthropes from their own kind? Well, it's a, it's a claim that misanthropes make that it's only actually on this planet human beings who can be as morally awful as this. Um, so the usual thought amongst most human beings is that we are the only moral agents on our planet. We're the only creatures who can reflect morally on their actions and on their behavior. Only human beings on this planet have a sense of right and wrong and good and evil. And that means that for us, the only moral agents are ourselves. Um, well, now, of course, some, if, you know, if you're a misanthrope like I am, and I'm talking to two extraterrestrials, I'll be wondering what you're thinking of human beings. But for us, animals are our victims and our subjects, not our moral peers. Interesting, because I know that there is study into the moral realm of animals. And that, you know, at least... Like with the monkeys? With the monkeys. I have, uh, there, was, there was something that, you know, we, it's quiet in space. We spend a lot of time watching your infinite televisions. Excellent. And there was one video where there was a researcher who was feeding monkeys... It was a choice between a cucumber and a grape. And if you feed the monkey a cucumber, it's fine. It loves the cucumber. But then if you feed its companion a grape, all of a sudden it becomes morally outraged that you're trying to feed it a cucumber. And the next time that the researcher hands the monkey the piece of cucumber, the monkey's like, what the hell is this? I don't want this and throws it back at the researcher and starts pounding the table and demand, shaking the bars of the, the cage and demanding fairness. And in some species, apparently, the monkey that's getting the grape refuses the grape until their peer gets a grape as well. So it seems like humans don't necessarily have a moral... Fairness. Is fairness what you mean by morality here? Well, yeah, I think that that's, a, that's a, a part of morality. But it seems like humans don't have a monopoly on this. Well, it's, it's a strategy that some misanthropes have used historically. They ask, you know, how do human beings compare with animals? And it's taken a very, very long time, actually, for lots of human beings these days to take seriously the idea that animals might have some sort of moral sense, like a sense of fairness, um, now, a sense of fairness in itself doesn't give you morality. That gives you a, one component. And the studies mm. that you just described, they suggest that animals might have certain moral abilities, like a sense to distinguish right and wrong and to wonder why that one's being treated better than others. But the idea that animals could have um, moral agency in the way that human beings do, that, for instance, animals can have a whole range of virtues and vices, that claims a little more controversial. Now, of course, we're limited in what we know about other species on our planet, and it's, uh, there's a lot of hard work to do in persuading people that animals have any sort of moral awareness. But still, I think it's clear that human beings have a much more complicated and distinctive moral life, individually and collectively. For example, there are certain vices that only human beings seem to have. For example, the, the cruel, violent desire to hunt and kill other species merely for pleasure, for instance. That seems to be very characteristic of humans. All animals, or at least all carnivores, will kill, but human beings do it for all sorts of trivial reasons, like recreation or because we're frustrated with other animals. So there are certain vices that do seem to be very distinctive to us. So even if there is a bit of continuity between us and the animals, we do seem to be distinctive in that sense. Hmm. Well, it's interesting to go back. You asked about how we see things from our planet and how we see the humans. And actually... We were kind of sent here to keep an eye on you guys because of this issue. And uh, we noticed one of your probes had made it out of your solar system. And our boss asked us to snatch that up. And we have some rules before you can become a 
intragalactic species. It can't cause chaos, no. and humans are very chaotic. Yes, we, our, one of the things that people enjoy on Earth is something called science fiction. So we imagine mm. what our science would be like in the future. And that often involves imagining what it would be like when we develop the technology to go to other planets and what will happen when we meet other intelligent species. And one big theme of lots of science fiction is uh, any intelligent extraterrestrials out there are probably not going to be very enthusiastic when they see what we're like. There's a lot of really beautiful things humans do, like... I personally love the human music, for instance. So I wouldn't judge the humans bad on average. Well, a, a misanthrope can agree that there are some good things that human beings have done, and they can agree that there are some good individual human beings. Um, in fact, one, one interesting feature of some misanthropes is that for them, the fact that there are some good people actually makes things worse because that proves hmm. that we are at least capable of being good sometimes under certain conditions. Hmm. So it's not like we are doomed to being awful creatures. Some people manage to do a pretty good job of being halfway decent. And so, some human beings, when they try hard, can produce wonderful, beautiful things. We can perform wonderful acts of compassion and generosity. It's just that overall, it seems, the way that we arrange our life, our structures and our values seems to drive us into violent, destructive, dogmatic behaviors. So we're not all bad, we're just mostly bad. Well, so there's this strange thing about the idea that it's the structures that are bad, but the people that are good. And so it seems like the ire of the misanthrope is not directed at individuals, it's more directed at the systems in which the individual lives, right? Yes, I think that's right. Um, there is a difference between some misanthropes. I mean, in, there are some misanthropes who I'm sure condemn all individual human beings, but that would be silly. Uh, for one thing, there are obviously some very good individuals, and it's not like, you know, anyone's interviewed all human beings and done a moral test of them. I mean, on Earth, there are certain religions um, that believe in gods and divine beings. They might think that God is capable of judging every individual human being, but not everybody believes that. I think instead the sensible misanthropes, they say, well, there are some individual human beings who are particularly awful and some are particularly bad, but what's really, really awful are the structures, the social arrangements, the values, the ways that we organize our life. This is what's really going to be corrupting. So one of the big human misanthropes was a philosopher, a French philosopher called Rousseau. Hmm. And he says that what's really corrupt is civilized man. He says, when human beings come together, we find ways of organizing our society. We have private property. We have ranks. So some people are given more social power than others. Some people have special responsibilities. And this is what corrupts people. It's the ways that we organize our societies. And the misanthrope thinks that the ways that we organize our societies these days are so complex and so corrupting that humankind as a whole, as a collective, just becomes morally awful. Even if there are people inside that human system trying to make it better or trying to be good, but they are struggling against a vicious system. Hmm. Do you think there isn't this sort of a fixation on corruptions, like judging an apple as bad just because it's got a hole in the side of it or something? I've always read that the best apples have holes in them because those are the tastiest ones. The worms like them. <laughs> always trust a worm. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's good advice if you ever visit Earth. We're on our way. Well, well there, I, I think there would be some misanthropes who could um, allow these slightly more complicated pictures. But I think they would say that our vices and failings, our little imperfections, they're not little localized failings that only crop up every now and again. These vices and failings are just spread all throughout the human world. So I can imagine a sort of human optimist who says, well, okay, you know, there is cruelty and violence and greed, but it's only in certain people, maybe the people who work in the banking system, or maybe it's only confined to certain situations like violence or social unrest, but most people, most of the time, don't have these vices. But I think a misanthrope says this just isn't true. It might be the case that failings like cruelty and greed and violence are more obvious or more intense in certain people and places, but they really are spread throughout the world in little ordinary everyday acts. So maybe a lot of people aren't dramatically cruel, so they're not performing horrible acts against people all the time, but in little ways every day in the ways that they talk and act in an informal basis, 
they show little streaks of greed and selfishness and vanity because our world makes us do this. So the misanthropes always are arguing against optimists, but they think that on balance, if we're honest about the state of the world and our lives, we come out as worse overall. Hmm. So you seem to think that perhaps the misanthropes can lead to a productive future, in some cases at least. Where... Through the activist misanthrope, you mean? Or through the... Because exactly. the activist misanthrope... You, you have four misanthropes, right? The hateful, the fugitive, the activist, and the quiet one. Yes, yes. So what you're describing is this, this hopeful, optimistic activist. So this is someone who thinks that human beings and humankind is morally awful as it is, but they're also an activist. They think that the proper response to the awfulness of human beings is, well, to get to work to organize, to gather, to do research, and try to find large-scale ways of reforming the human condition. You know, maybe through forming social movements, uh, maybe through trying to transform political systems. And many of the greatest people in human history have been activists of this sort, people who try to lead and inspire others to make these dramatic changes in our moral condition. And usually the activists look forward to a future where over time we get better through social activism and cultural developments and scientific research, maybe encounters with ex extraterrestrials, we'll gradually get better over time. And that is one attractive sort of misanthropy because you get to be honest about what we're like, but hopeful about what we might be in the future. Right, and it seems like the alternative is rather dangerous if you're hateful and misanthropic. This is sort of how you get you know, All suicidal maniacs and Dylan Klebolds and cases like this. What's the border that separates? Are these just totally distinct psychological profiles? Well, I, I think there are these, there are different ways to be a misanthrope. And in, and in my experience, most people find themselves awkwardly sliding between different <laughs> attitudes. So mm. maybe a person has certain experiences of um, the awfulness of human beings, they become angry and they want to tear it all down. And then they sort of cool down and they relax and they think, well, no, I shouldn't be angry. I should be hopeful. And if I don't like the world, I should change it. And they become an activist. And then they have bad experiences of frustration and defeat and they keep getting knocked back all the time. So they become fugitives and they want to just escape the human world and flee away somewhere else. But then they realize that they can't live as human beings all alone because human beings are very social creatures. We only really live well amongst other people, even if living amongst other people is also painful and difficult. So these become a different sort of quietist misanthrope. They don't try to destroy the world. They're not trying to flee from it. They're not trying to change it on the large scale. The quietest misanthrope, they want to find ways of accommodating to human failings, living quietly or inconspicuously. So living amongst people, but trying to remain safe from them. And I think most misanthropes are caught between these different attitudes and they try to find a way of stabilizing them. Hmm. So as you see, we're a very complicated species. Yeah, we love that. Endless work for us. So that's interesting. So it's almost like these are not individuals. These are compartments of individuals, each of these types of misanthropy. But what causes the snap where somebody completely devotes themselves to fight against humanity. How does that happen? Well, I think in many cases, it's going to be particular experiences people have. So there's another great earth philosopher named Immanuel Kant, and he has lots of things to say about misanthropy. And one of his big insights was what really makes a person into a misanthrope is not going to be arguments or philosophical reflections. That's too abstract. He said it's really long, sad experience of human failings, long experience of people's cruelties and selfishness and vanity and vengefulness. He says at a certain point, these experiences are either so many or so powerful, they just tip you over into these forms of angry violence or profound fearfulness. He says this is why some people will be condemned to misanthropy, because, of course, on Earth, we don't choose most of the experiences that happen to us. Our experiences are shaped by where we live, when we live, the state of our society. And in this case, he says, if you live in certain, certain times or certain places, and they're very awful and you're very honest, misanthropy becomes irresistible. What? And that's why he thinks we shouldn't condemn all forms of misanthropy. He said it's often a rational response. 
It's a rational response, especially when you look around and everything is so negative. I wonder, though, if, let's say, the Earth was different, and instead of humans, it was octopi, octopuses. Do you really think that the octopuses at this level of density and this level of development would succeed in having a different society? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, there, there's an interesting answer to that question given by some of the misanthropes. Um, their argument is not that it's, it's not human beings specifically who are kind of awful in this way. It's any form of intelligent creature who lives in social communities. Now on earth, the way that our evolution has gone, that happens to be human beings alone. We're the only creatures who are intelligent and com complex in that way. But suppose we imagine your octopus world. Now if octopuses continue to become ever more intelligent and ever more complex and form those sorts of societies, then I can imagine that over time, they might be able to develop into these awful ways. So that philosopher I mentioned, Rousseau, one of his arguments is that whenever you have intelligent creatures with many, many appetites and desires and limited resources, they will start to develop temptations towards greediness, vanity, competitiveness. They'll try to find ways to use their cleverness to manipulate other people. They will use their physical strength to try to overpower other people. And so for Rousseau, the, the origins of misanthropy are not specifically human. They're available to any intelligent social creature with needs, desires, wants, and temptations. And I could imagine that if you had these super intelligent octopuses or maybe types of extraterrestrial, they might be just as vulnerable to these vices and failings as on this planet right now, human beings are. Now is the intelligence component just because it makes them so effective? Or you think the intelligence is related to their ability to develop vices? That's a very nice question. I think that lots of our vices are grounded in our intelligence. Mm. So take a very simple example, um, vices like dishonesty and untruthfulness. So if you spend any time with human beings, one thing you'll know, many people are very untruthful. People lie, exaggerate, deceive, manipulate, sometimes for trivial purposes, but sometimes for very dodgy purposes. For example, we might deceive people in order to disadvantage them. We might lie to people in order to cause them emotional distress. But of course, the ability to lie and be dishonest presupposes a certain amount of intelligence. So one thing that human parents often notice in their very young children is there's a certain point when children on Earth get clever enough to learn how to manipulate their parents. <laughs> and so there are connections between intelligence and vices. There are some vices which you can have even if you're quite dumb or lacking intelligence. But there are lots of clever vices like manipulativeness that you really have to be quite intelligent in order to have. This word intelligence, you mean the ability to conceptualize or relate con concepts to one another, something like that? How do you define intelligence? Think, yeah, on their mm. planet. Well, on, on this planet, we don't have any established or fixed definition of intelligence. But I think what you described, the ability to form and use concepts, that would be an important part of it. Other senses of intelligence might be the ability to understand and manipulate natural processes or parts of the environment. And there'll be lots of forms of interpersonal intelligence that you need to communicate with and understand other creatures. So it's extremely complicated. But I think the misanthrop says, well, the more complicated intelligence is, the more vices it can sustain. Now, you can also use manipulation for benevolent ends. Yeah, that usually ends well. Well, isn't that what therapy is? What? Therapy. Oh, that thing where they talk to people? Yeah, the humans go and talk their issues out. Yeah, is that a form of manipulation, do you figure? I think therapy done properly is not necessarily a form of manipulation. Mm. Huh. I might imagine it's like many of the things that human beings produce. They can be used for good or for evil. And Music. there's an important tendency of people often to use tools for the wrong purposes. For example... Um, one thing that human beings are very interested in right now is, is something very complex called empathy. Now, one common definition of empathy is it's an ability to understand and to make sense of the emotions and the feelings of other people. Now, that doesn't quite work for empathy because some people 
who are very, very good at that are people we call psychopaths or manipulators mm. or Machiavellians. Those people are very, very good at understanding and responding to people's feelings. They just do it to manipulate and control people. Are artists and psychopaths? There are, probably have been some psychopathic artists. <laughs> are they trying to manipulate people's feelings? Yeah, there has to be some aspect where manipulation is done for the greater good. Because if you have somebody who's like a therapist who's mucking about in your head and putting things back where they belong and helping you figure out weird patterns of how you think, then they are manipulating you, but not necessarily to your detriment. Manipulation, the, the problem with humans is the fact that so many of them use manipulation not to do good. They have great power and don't necessarily embody the idea that with that great power they can actually choose to do something great. Well, this is, this is where a philosopher like myself would want um, a good definition of manipulation. And one way that we can do definitions is we give criteria. So, for instance, um, one criteria might be um, an action doesn't count as manipulative um, if it has some positive end. Hmm. So suppose, for instance, it's my friend's birthday. On Earth, we celebrate our birthdays. We have parties. We take people out. We buy them food and drink. We say nice things about them. Wow. Now, if I want to take someone out on, a, on their birthday, they often enjoy it if it's what we call a surprise party. So if they don't know that they're going to a celebration of, of themselves. Now, in that sense, I might manipulate my friend. I might say, um, could you just come to my office at six o'clock? I want to have a quick a quick conversation with you. Or I might say, maybe you and I could just go for a quiet drink after work since it's your birthday. Now, in those cases, in a certain sense, I'm manipulating my friend because I'm trying to control their behavior by giving them false information. But then again, many people say, well, that's not really manipulation because it's for good purposes. I'm not deceiving my friend in order to upset them or harm them, but actually to benefit them. So that could be one criteria, is what the motivations and the intentions are. But that's Another a, that's a beautiful be, thing that comes out of being an intelligent species. That kind of pseudo-manipulation. Or we should give that a name, perhaps, also. The, the positive manipulation? Remember. The positive kind, yeah. That's a good question. It's an important part of what we call friendship. Hmm. Friendship, yeah, that's a beautiful human thing. But so, okay... There definitely are points where you can affect somebody's behavior for good. We'll have to brainstorm what we can call that, because manipulation apparently is just for bad things. So, where does that leave us? That humans are intelligent, they're capable of these manipulations, and they apply them freely. But I still maintain that any intelligent creature that, or any creature that develops intelligence would have to pass through a phase of not knowing how to apply that intelligence properly. And humans haven't been around for that long in the grand scheme of things. You're what, 20,000 years old? Mickey's 100,000 years old. Mickey alone is 100,000 years old. Your baby. He looks good for it. Hey, he does. Thanks. He does. But it's just, it's such a little short span of time for humans to have figured this out. And the stories that are most ancient on Earth are the stories where people do bad things to one another and then they get punished. So doesn't that speak to that being a state of animal behavior rather than human behavior? I would say that the human behavior is all the good stuff. And the bad stuff is kind of leftovers, you know? That's, that's an attractively optimistic take on human <laughs> being. I mean, th there's another Earth philosopher named uh, Nietzsche, and he had his famous description. He says, human beings are um, on a tightrope between the ape and the angel. Mm. He says, we we've clearly moved away from being apes in certain obvious senses, but we're not yet anything like angels. He says, we're in a, a transitory stage of our biological, moral, and social evolution. Now, I can imagine that's true, and it is one way that I would probably like to think about human beings. I mean, as you say, we haven't been around that long, actually, um, and we have a long way to go. But this is where the misanthrope has to do a bit of research and say, well, let's look at history and anthropology and evolutionary biology and see how we are doing over time. 
And there are lots of optimists on planet Earth right now mm. writing these inspirational stories about how we are, in fact, despite all the evidence, getting better. Um, some of these are historians, some are psychologists, and they write these very optimistic books about how we are actually getting better. They say it might not look like we're getting better, but if you look at the cold, hard data, human beings are, for instance, less violent than they are. Mm -hmm. So one of the very famous optimists right now is a, a psychologist called Steven Pinker. And he wrote a very famous book called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And it's a very long book and it's very densely argued. But his claim is that human beings are getting better over time because we're much less violent than we used to be. Now, there's lots you can say about that book, but one of the problems is that violence is only one dimension of what's wrong with human beings. You know, if you look at the whole range of our failings, the vices of violence are only some of them, vices like cruelness and brutality. But nowhere in the book does he give any indication that there's any reduction in the amount of greediness, vanity, narcissism, self-absorption, dogmatism, inauthenticity, callousness, and cold-heartedness. Moreover, there are many forms of violence that he doesn't talk much about. For example, there's not too much discussion of violence against animals, but human beings destroy about 200 billion creatures a year. So even if you say we're getting less violent, and that might be true, we're not getting any less envious or greedy or jealous or tribalistic. And that's one problem, I think, for the optimists. When you look at the sheer variety and diversity of our failings, you'd need to write a lot of very, very, very thick books to even begin to make the case that we're getting better morally in a broad sense. Hmm. So then how does this not end in an anti-human condemnation? Or action that's anti-human. Right? Because, so yes, you look at all of this and humans are, it's hard to say that humans aren't getting better in some ways. Just in terms of what poverty looks like, what health looks like, these very, very simple markers that you can point to. And it kind of reminds me of life expectancy on Earth, where if you look at life expectancy 500 years ago, the average was something around 30. And if you look at life expectancy in a place like the United States or Europe or Japan, you're up at around 80, 85. But that didn't come because life expectancy was extended from 30 upwards. It came because medicine was capable of ensuring the survival of those below the age of five. And, and the moms. And the moms. And those below the age of 15. And so basically, you stop having wars, you stop having infectious disease that kills people at a young age, and all of a sudden life expectancy shoots up. And now, all of a sudden, you get to a point where it sticks again. There isn't a lot of positive growth in life expectancy on Earth right now, and so now it requires a shift. What does it mean to continue to expand life expectancy? And it seems like humans have done a great job of dealing with these really, really, really big things, with wars, with slavery, with starvation. You know, how many, how many animals did you say were killed every year? Estimates are about 200 billion. Uh, but, okay, terrible. But before that, how many people died of starvation? How many people starved every year because things were running out? And so there's this constant push-pull where, okay, we've, you've fixed something, you've broken something else, now you have to go fix this new thing, and then you'll probably break something else. And then it's this constant fight with your own intelligence to push forward. But it seems like the misanthrope would say that it's impossible for humans to push forward to a point where they're no longer making these mistakes. Only one kind of misanthrope. I think that only one, it seems like only one kind of misanthrope would argue against that, the activist misanthrope. The other ones would just throw their hands up, right? Well, the, the enemy misanthrope would want to sort of tear it all down. And one of the, one of the slogans of the eco-misanthropes is unmake civilization, try to dismantle it and move back to simpler ways of life. Um, Whereas the fugitives, they didn't want anything to do with the human world. The activists, they point to the developments that you're pointing to, the enormous advances in medicine, technology, science, and so on. 
But I think even the most optimistic of the, of the activists would point out certain limitations. So for instance, um, many of the achievements that human beings might claim are not quite as impressive when you look at them. So for instance, there's another a modern optimist called um, Rudger Bregman, and he has a very nice book called Humankind. And he's emphasizing, again, this optimistic doctrine that we're getting better. And at one point in the book, he makes uh, the claim that you just made, that um, slavery on earth, the enslavement of other human beings, has been abolished. Unfortunately, that's simply not true. So we have an organization called the United Nations, which estimates about 40 million human beings are still enslaved right now. And there are about 150 million child workers whose conditions aren't really much different from that of enslaved persons. They're oppressed and abused and so on. And even when they look at cases like the sciences, where we can claim wonderful achievements, and no misanthrope should, should deny the achievements of science, but they'll still point out that, like any human enterprise, the sciences eventually get corrupted by various problems. For instance, lots of the scientific knowledge developed by some of the human societies um, were actually stolen from many of the world's Aboriginal peoples. Lots of the sciences were immediately put towards very violent ends. In fact, violence and military conquest has been a main driver of lots of scientific research. And they'll also point to similar things with medicine. So for instance, you know, on earth we have the medical resources to treat and cure all sorts of diseases. But many of the diseases that we focus our resources upon tend to be the ones that affect the world's wealthier people, not the world's poorer people. For instance, we have the resources to eradicate certain infectious diseases, but we don't tend to focus those, those resources on the world's poorest people because there's no profit to be made in selling medicine, medications to them. So even in these cases where we can point to something wonderful like the sciences or technology or medicine, still we will find our vices and failings corrupting this work. And I suppose a misanthrope might say, despite all of these great things, we never do as well as we could. We will always fail most of our moral tests, like making med our modern medicine available to all the world people. That just doesn't happen. Well, I think that's probably because the development is driven by profits, right? Like, the only people willing to work on medicine are the ones that can get paid to do it, seems like. And perhaps that's a better situation than not having it at all. Because at the point that you have it, then you can actually eventually deploy it to these countries that are less wealthy. I mean, that is the hope. I mean, you're entirely right. It, it's much, much better. It's a thousand times better to have science, technology and medicine than not to, because, you know, they have transformed the lives of many, many human beings for the better in all sorts of ways. For example, as you say, we live longer, we're vulnerable to fewer diseases, we can do all sorts of wonderful things. So you... The problem is that the, the, the goodness is not distributed properly and you have to work enormously hard on planet Earth to achieve any goodness. And it's so easily undone. Hmm. Do you think that something can be done to change that? Or do you think that that's just how it is? Well, this is a fundamental question for any misanthrop is, <laughs> you know, which of those attitudes should I adopt? Should I be an activist and get involved and try to do things to change the world for the better? Or should I live in these more quietistic ways and focus upon improvement of the little small part of the world that I can control? And personally, I I'm caught between the activist and the quietist stances. There are things I try to do to improve things on a larger scale, but most of my efforts are focused on the small scale. Because one of the, one of the things that a misanthrope worries about is that if you try to be an activist, that can drive some of your vices. Hmm. And if you're a misanthrope, you'll always see vices in your path. The question is really, which vices do I want to steer into and which ones do I want to avoid? Mm. Wait, hold on, I have a question. What's so bad about vices? Well, vi vice is, that's a technical word that philosophers use. So a vice is any bad or negative trait of character. Um, so, for example, vices would include greediness, callousness, selfishness. They describe very specific ways of being a bad person. And at the same time, there are virtues, and virtues are excellences of character. They're specific ways of being a good person. And the idea is that vices are bad either because they lead you to do bad things or because they show that you have bad values or bad attitudes or bad desires. And if you're a philosopher, you can argue all you like about whether vices are bad because of their effects or their motives, or you can just say, well, as long as they're bad, they're bad. 
either bad for you or bad for someone else, huh? But I think that greed and selfishness and these other vices, they actually make a lot of sense. I mean, you can't live without considering yourself. You can't live without having some center that you're taking care of, right? And so perhaps it's perhaps it makes sense not to view them as bad, but seeing their overgrowth as being bad. Because that way it prov you, you can engage in a little bit of greed. You're allowed to be a little greedy, maybe. You're allowed to be a little selfish, maybe. Well, I, I, th I think that even the most realistic ethicist would agree that vice is inevitable because human beings are imperfect moral agents and it takes an enormous amount of work to try to reform your character. So some people like to compare, compare having virtues with having good physical health. You have to work hard, there's a lot of exercise, there's a lot of discipline. It's, it's very hard to keep your moral character in good condition. But at the same time, the, the claim is always that vices are always going to be bad things. It might be understandable that you have them, but they're always bad things. And they're always something that you should strive to try to remove from your character. So in the case of greediness, now, there are all sorts of things I enjoy consuming. For example, there are alcohols I like to drink. There are foods I like to eat. But enjoying those things and consuming them is not in itself greedy. It's only greedy if I do it in ways that's excessive or inappropriate or harmful. And in those cases, I've become greedy. And the idea is that you can live a perfectly good, happy, flourishing human life whilst acting only in the space of the virtues. It's just that human beings feel some strange temptation to act viciously. And the ideal is that you live a life which is both good and happy and flourishing and virtuous. Hmm. So what's interesting to me is that you don't count yourself among the enemy category. Is that true? Yes, I, I don't have any enemy tendencies at all. I mean, to be an enemy misanthrope, you really need to have those negative feelings of hatred or disgust at human beings, but also the, the disposition to do harm or violence, because the enemy is fundamentally is a harm doer. They want to do harm to the human world, tear it all down or disrupt its functions. I don't, I don't feel anything like that at all. Um, so even in the case of the abuse of animals, for instance, there are some people who want to disrupt animal agriculture and try to disrupt all these industrial systems that destroy animals on a massive scale. But that sort of violence and disruption, that's, that's not my way of going about things. Yeah, that Partly seems really scary. Vices. Oh, it involves vices. Well, it involves vices like hatefulness, violence, disruptiveness. It would often involve causing harm to other human beings. They're not things that I find temperamentally very attractive. Why do you think that these vices were established to be harmful to humans? Is it something that pre precedes intelligence and being able to point to it and say that this and to philosophize over it? Or is it something that happens only after you can analyze the sort of the relationships between people and how these vices affect things? Hmm. You'll get different answers to that question from different philosophers. Um, so one answer that would be given by many religious philosophers, those who believe in a God, they will say that God gave to us um, instructions about the virtues that we ought to cultivate. Mm. So if you look at some earth religions like Christianity, um, in that religion, God gave instructions to human beings to cultivate certain virtues like kindness and compassion and to avoid specific vices like um, greediness, jealousy and, and so on. Now, in other traditions in the world, you get different virtues and vices instructed by divine beings or by gods. But these days, I suppose the most popular answer doesn't involve gods at all. Um, for many people, the virtues and vices came about through our biological evolution. Hmm. When we, we were in early stage of our evolution, human beings developed certain needs. For example, we have a need to live together in social communities. Now, in order to live well in a social community, you need certain dispositions. Um, you need to be able, for instance, to rely upon what your fellow community members say and do. And that is the seed of a virtue like truthfulness. Maybe initially we just we started to become truthful just so that we can coordinate our behavior and live in extended social groups. But over time, that, that little seed developed into a virtue like truthfulness. And I think many philosophers these days would go for a story like that. You explain the origins of the virtues by reference to their 
original functions in early human societies. And over time, as our societies get more complex and we start to reflect, the virtues become more complex and sophisticated. That seems to boil down to trust, right? I think trust is an important part of it because trust is essential to all human communities that I know of and might even be central to your sorts of communities as well. But trust is vital for all sorts of other virtues, not just virtues like truthfulness, but virtues like compassion. Um, any virtues that relate you to other people, trust is often what holds human communities together. And when trust breaks down between human communities, that's one of the times when vices will really flourish. So you seem like you're in a time where trust has broken down, just from the outside. I don't know how it is on the ground, but it seems like things have fallen <laughs> apart a little bit. Yes, many, many human societies right now have quite profound problems of trust. Uh, sometimes it's a loss of trust in specific people like our leaders. Sometimes it's a breakdown in trust between different social or religious or ethnic groups. It's driven by phenomena like polarization where people voice increasingly extreme beliefs in order to distinguish themselves from other groups. So we have big problems with breakdowns of trust between individuals, cultures, institutions. Sometimes this is because of accidental events like crises. Sometimes it's because there are some people working to create distrust for their own purposes, for mm. example, to divide communities and set people against one another. But we do have big problems of trust. There are still certain people in professions that we trust, but we are struggling with trust right now. And that's part of lots and lots of our problems. It seems like in response to a lot of this distrust, very popular media circulates, very popular opinions concern essentially a enemy misanthropic stance, which is sort of like the alternative to X, Y, and Z structures is to burn them to the ground. Everything is so corrupt that it must be destroyed, that type of thing? Yeah. I wonder if you, being not an enemy of humanity, are concerned about the tendency of individuals to promote the enemy p platform and how those individuals can be perhaps, I don't want to say manipulated, but <laughs> pulled back into some of the more productive misanthropies. Well, you're right to see connections between some forms of misanthropy, like the enemy form, and certain horrible attitudes on Earth. Um, attitudes like racism, sexism, Islamophobia. Um, there's a nice example of this, actually. In the, the 1980s, about three decades ago on Earth, there was a group of eco-misanthropes. And they described themselves as misanthropes, and they said, humankind is awful, we need to disrupt human beings, we need to dismantle our industrial systems, our economic systems, because human beings are so atrocious and we destroy the planet. But if you look at their writings and their remarks, it's clear that it's not humankind they wanted to destroy. It wasn't all human beings they wanted to get rid of. It was only specific human beings. Hmm. So for instance, uh, they said, we should allow famines to flourish in Africa, one of our continents. Now that won't reduce the human population, it will reduce the African population. So to me, that's not misanthropic because it's not aimed at humankind. It's racist. It's aimed at Africans. Similarly, they said we should allow um, a horrible, horrible virus called HIV to spread in various world countries. We shouldn't treat it or put any resources into it. But again, that's not misanthropic. That's homophobic because the intended victims are not all human beings, but specific groups of human beings. And this is a case of people who, who walk and talk like misanthropes, but really they're not. They're homophobes, they're sexists, they're racists. But there are important connections because the attitudes and behaviors are similar. There's the encouragement to violence. There's the incitement to see other people as your enemies and your opponents. There's the policies of violence and destruction. And that's one reason that I don't like the enemy stance. It's too close to various awful things that human beings are capable of. And that's why you should always pull away from the enemy stance. It fundamentally, it motivates violence. And we have enough of that in the world. That's why I would want to lean towards the activist or the quietist stance, because they, they try not to do any harm in the world. Quite the opposite. Do you have and any... You can give... Go ahead, sorry. And well, I think you can give people good reasons to want to adopt the other misanthropic stances. Yeah, that's you know? what I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I think for one thing, it's just nicer, I think, if your life is not dominated by violence and hatred. There are better ways to live as a human being. Well, there's some people that seem like they need that, though, right? Because there always used to be a class of people that were in the military or that were fighting wars or that were actively violent in the world. And say what you will about human development, there do seem to be less people in standing armies that are waiting at the gates of foreign cities. And so those people are now just distributed throughout society. And they probably catch on to that mindset quite quickly, and they probably want the violence and the hatred and the anger in their lives. Well, this is a question that some of those optimistic um, people I described discuss. Um, so I mentioned this fellow, Rudiger Bregman. Now, in his book, he offers lots of very interesting scientific research, which suggests that actually it's very, very difficult to make human beings commit violence towards other human beings. Hmm. So he gives this very interesting evidence from the history of warfare, which suggests that actually uh, most human beings in warfare don't actually fire at the enemy. They don't use weapons that we call bows and guns. They either don't fire or they shoot over the heads of their enemies. And he says, well, this says something good about human beings. It's, it's very, very difficult to make us violent towards our fellow kind. You have to do a lot to people. You have to brutalize them. You have to train them in certain ways. Now, that's a very attractive story, and I really, really hope it's true. But of course, one problem is that if you look over the history of our military technology, we've also become extremely good at finding ways to overcome this natural resistance. And if you look at our societies more widely right now, it's clear that even if people are naturally resistant to hating their fellow human beings, there are very, very effective ways to make people hate other human beings. For example, there are ways to marginalize hum other human beings, to mark them out as, as vermin, as dirty, as corrupted, as dangerous, as criminalistic. And unfortunately, even if people resist violence and hatred, we are very, very skilled, some of us anyway, at making people hateful and violent. And there seems to be an epidemic of that going on in parallel with the pandemic, right? And there seem to be two camps that are breaking down. One camp that feels strongly about the necessity of lockdowns, and the other camp that feels strongly about, well, open everything back up and who dies, dies. Yes. And that's a good example of the the misanthropes claim that it takes very, very little to tip human beings over into their vices. So one claim that misanthropes make is that even if a lot of the time human beings behave in a more or less okay way, it takes very, very little to reveal their violence, selfishness, and so on. Just put them into disrupted conditions, deprive them of certain things, introduce fear and anxiety, and people will tend to act quite badly. Um, and the, I suppose the current pandemic situation that we're going through is an example of this. Um, in the early days of the pandemic, at least in the country that I live in, there was lots of very optimistic talk of a, a moral transformation of people becoming friendlier and more neighborly, looking out for one another, community groups springing into action. And it was all very encouraging. And to a degree, it was true. But at the same time, there's been lots of negative behavior as well. So, for example, people moved quite easily from looking out for their neighbours to seeing if their neighbours conform to various um, social measures, seeing if they participate in the new social rituals like applauding healthcare workers. There are lots of people who became very, very complacent quite quickly. There are lots of people who, in their intellectual responses, have become quite dogmatic and closed-minded, jumping to conclusions, not asking certain questions. And this is partly because it's a very, very difficult time and it's difficult, it's very difficult for people to be at their best morally under these sorts of difficult conditions. When they're suffering grief and uncertainty and loss and disruption, these are hard times. And it's wrong to condemn people for their failings under such difficult circumstances. But still, it's always going to be the case that we have to respond to these problems at a certain point. So in the, again, in the country I live in, there is a big debate, as you said, about lockdown. And one difficult aspect of this situation is that lockdown, our measure to control it, is possibly doing just as much damage, actually, as this COVID virus is. Mm. So the virus is very, very sadly killing people. It has a death rate. 
uh, and that's very, very sad. But at the same time, lockdown has a whole range of very negative effects. It's disrupting people's mental health, their sense of security, it's affecting their jobs, their employment, their sense of their future, their ability to plan, their education, it's affecting their emotional lives, it affects the development of their children. And there comes a, very, there comes a point when you have to have a difficult conversation and ask, are these measures proportional to the risks? And it's quite difficult to have those conversations because a response of many people is, if you ask that question, then you're being cold and callous and calculating. But it's an important question to ask because arguably now at this point, the lockdown measures are causing much more disruption and violence and harm than the virus itself. And when your control measures are doing more damage than the thing you're trying to control, then you need to have those very difficult conversations. But difficult conversations amongst human beings typically generate vices. People become defensive and anxious and aggressive. And sometimes you just have to face that head on. Do you have any particular advice as to how humans can engage in these really difficult conversations? Without turning to vice? <laughs> Add it's vice against difficult. vice. Well, as a philosopher, you must have pretty good rules for this sort of thing. There are, there are good strategies, I think, for engaging with people um, about these difficult and complex topics. I think a, one of them is always fundamentally maintaining a respect and an empathy for other people. Because there's a strong temptation to always see your opponent, the person you're arguing against, as somehow necessarily wrong or at fault. When in fact, what's usually happening is that the person is in the same situation you are. They're struggling with a difficult situation that arouses their emotions. They don't have all the information they need. You don't have all the information you need. You will both make mistakes in the debate. You'll both get things wrong. And so you proceed with respect and empathy. You recognize that they're not just a thinking robot, that they're a person with needs and vulnerabilities and anxieties. So you think maybe the person I'm arguing with is getting these things wrong because they're just desperately worried about the people that they love. Or maybe you're thinking, well, this person is jumping to conclusions because they're so afraid of the risks. And empathy and respect of that sort is important because it can make us go slower to take more care with our arguments, not just to launch in with dramatic claims like you're wrong or very abstract claims like, haven't you seen this latest bit of evidence or this latest piece of research? It's to recognize that people's thinking and reasoning is bound up with the wider structure of their life, with their concerns, their anxieties, their worries. And I suppose the lesson there is, when you engage with a person in a debate, you really have to engage with the whole of that person, their emotions, their feelings, their interpersonal relationships. That's what you have to do. And it makes the conversations often slower, and they don't probably go as quickly as you'd like them to, but they will be proceeding on a basis of considerateness and kindness and respect. You're recognizing that these aren't just interesting abstract issues to debate or discuss, they're bound up with how people live their lives. And whenever you're dealing with how people live their lives, you should tread carefully. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. And you probably aren't going to see somebody change their mind in the middle of a debate, right? Not often in that immediate way. And that's one problem with many debates. Some people rush through a debate. They think that, well, once I give a person this argument or this bit of evidence, they'll change their mind straight away, just like that. But changing a mind is not usually like that. It's much more like changing a relationship with somebody. It takes time and repeated exposure. It depends on trust, which you were talking about earlier. And I think some people go wrong in debates because they think, once I give, my, give this person my brilliant argument or this excellent piece of counter evidence, they'll just change their mind, snap, mm -hmm. just like that. But that's rarely the case. Because when people are thinking about ideas, they're not just asking, does this make sense? Or can I understand this? They're also asking, how would this change my life? How would this change my feelings? How would this change how I live? And that sort of thinking takes time. And that's why you shouldn't expect someone to just change their mind straight away in these radical ways. It takes long, sustained, often difficult, but always trustful conversations. And this trust, this building of trust, can happen between two people when they're patient and empathetic with one another. But in order for... Uh, in order for human systems 
to shift in a positive direction, humans also have to trust in those structures as well. But there hasn't been a central structure that humans trust in for a long time. Maybe since the decrease of, religi of religiosity across the world, where there's no longer the central authority that people can turn to and people can believe. So how does that get rebuilt? Well, I think people have quite complex relations of trust with different institutions and practices and different communities of people. So, for example, I think very few people have um, a blunt attitude of unconditional trust. That seems extraordinarily rare. What usually happens is that people have certain degrees of trust that are tied into um, the behavior of institutions. And that means that people can exercise a degree of control over who they trust. So a good example here is when you look at governments. Now, in most human societies, or at least the one that I live in, the government changes regularly. The people in charge change every few years through events called elections. Now, when governments change, people change the degree of trust. For example, you might think, well, I don't trust that political party. I don't trust that leader. And so they alter their trust. And that means that people can exercise some degree of control over who and what and how much they trust. For example, they might ask, well, I used to trust these people because their advice was always very good. When I followed their advice, my life tended to go better. But lately, their advice has been bad advice. And so they, they don't abandon trust straight away, but they do sort of kind of hold it at an arm's length and say, well, maybe I should rethink this. Like, why are they giving me bad advice? Are they giving me bad advice or is this something else? And those negotiations of trust are very, very difficult, partly because it takes a lot of effort to just stop and think about the trust you put in institutions. It's hard enough to live life, let alone reflect on it. But that's where it's very useful to think about trust in terms of communities. So often, if I'm having a crisis of trust in an institution or some community, I don't just sit by myself and think about it. I ask other people. Mm. I have friends or colleagues or other people I can reach out to to help me with these reflections. And I think that's one thing that human communities need very much. In order to maintain and update their attitudes of trust, they need to engage with other people. They need to be able to trust those people. They need to make sure that the people they're asking are diverse and critical and self-reflective. They need critical pushback as well. Criticism is crucial. So not just asking only the people who agree with you or only the people who share your views. You need a diversity of critical perspectives. Some people have this naturally out of luck or design. Some people don't. But what would matter here is that issues of trust and so on are always going to be dependent on the diversity and quality of your relationships with other people. Now, if you don't have that background social support, it's much, much, much more difficult. Uh, one thing that you need then is strong social communities and strong social relationships. Yeah, I was going to say it's an interesting time on Earth because for the first time it seems like a lot of distrusting people can all get together and sort of reinforce their distrust, particularly with institutional narratives and academic science, things like that. Yeah, how does social media play into the misanthropic perspective? <laughs> I think the overwhelming perspective is that social media confirms or the misanthropic verdicts. Uh -oh. <laughs> so I suppose I remember, I, I'm young enough to remember when social media was first being introduced. And the, the very uh, optimistic rhetoric was that this would facilitate new conversations, new open-mindedness. It would make people more inquisitive. It would help us to learn, form new connections with people. And to a degree, it does that. Sure. Social media, I form good relationships with other people through social media, including people I never would have met. So I remember when, for example, a social media network called Facebook first arrived in my country. And the hope of many people was that it would make people friendlier and more open. It would help us form new friendships with strangers. It would help us get new information. And to a degree, it's done that. I learn lots from social media. <laughs> I have great friendships through social media, including friendships I could never keep up if it wasn't for social media. For example, people who live in distant countries. But at the same time, social media also encourages certain vices as well. For example, it can make people more aggressive, more antagonistic. It can actually lead us to disengage from other people. And the misanthrope will say, well, this is what happens with everything that human beings develop. There's always some possibilities for good, and some of those good possibilities will be realized. 
Well, there are also many, many possibilities for corruption. Everything can be subverted by human beings. If you can find a way to make it uh, vicious or aggressive or dogmatic, human beings will find a way of doing that. Does that, some of that have to do with the love of humans for the drama that that brings to their lives? We were talking to someone who made this interesting point about science fiction because in most science fiction, the stories that humans are telling themselves about the future look a whole lot like the present. There's not really a big shift in terms of human value structures. Human versus human kind Human of versus human stuff, yeah. But there is this one show called Star Trek that especially, I think that she was saying, what was it, The Next Generation? I haven't watched any of them. No, neither have I. But, but I've heard from her that this was unique in that it was a cultural product that didn't center human to human conflict. Ah, yes. I know the show that you mean. Um, it was very famous, yes, when it came out for having this very optimistic vision where human beings from all different races and nationalities will come together and live in harmony, committed to noble ideals. But uh, an interesting feature is that they made, I think, four or five different series of that Star Trek program. And in later series, the world became a bit grittier. They put back in the conflict and the violence and the uncertainty um, of human beings in the human world and tried to show the the other side of those ideals. In fact, in some of the latest series, you have some members who abandon this this federation of wonderful moral, you know, scientific explorers and in fact turn away from it. Um, and I think that's that again reflects something quite nice about human beings, that even when they're given these wonderful utopian visions. Sooner or later, people start to say, well, this is just too perfect. This is just too lovely. I mean, who are these, these human beings who are all the time nice, polite, friendly, efficient, friendly, and hardworking? These people aren't, aren't really human. They lack some of the rawness of human beings. Are they never envious or jealous? Because that's part of what it means to be human too. Hmm. And this is where the misanthrope might say, well, when we emphasize vices and failings, in a certain sense, we're not condemning human beings we're just describing them because part of what it means to be human beings is to be morally imperfect it's the sort of creatures that we are we can be virtuous and vicious we can be wicked and wise we can be very selfish and very selfless and so human beings are just complicated and that means that our attitude towards them is really one of ambivalence it's just part of what we are and we just have to find ways to try to live with that hmm And do you agree? I think there's a deep truth in that, yes. Um, I think that we should probably have very, very high moral ideals for what human beings could be, and we should strive to try to realize them. But I think that these moral imperfections are just part of the texture of human beings. What one philosopher called the crooked timber of humanity. It's just part of what we are. We were never made perfect by some super intelligent extraterrestrial race or by gods. We are the messy contingent products of evolutionary processes on a small ball of rock orbiting a small planet on the outer edge of the Milky Way galaxy. We're not necessarily destined for moral excellence or greatness. Hmm. We are evolved bipeds trying to work our way forwards. And our moral perfections are just part of the sorts of creatures that we are. What are you evolving toward? I don't know if we're evolving towards anything. Um, I don't think there's necessarily any fundamental goal. Although I think that one feature of our intelligence and our moral abilities is that we can form ideals and we can try to direct our lives and our societies towards them. And I think that's the sort of uh, developmental vision human beings should have because we do have values and ideals like compassion and justice and fairness and so on. We do recognize virtues and people a lot of the time do desire those virtues. I think the struggle though is to try to do the constant, constant work of trying to steer human beings along those paths towards virtue, despite all the temptations to veer off into vice. But that's what law does though, doesn't it? In many ways, it it keeps them on the path. It seems like law is this iterative process of assembling rules and regulations. In the absence of religion, it's basically 
the only mechanism that humans have for being able to evaluate what's right and what's wrong. Well, I, th I think it's a misanthrope could say that we could, in a sense, look at all human cultural developments as components of this vast moral infrastructure. We're trying to build ways, not just to find out new things about the world or to produce pretty things to look at or to eat or to whatever. We're trying to construct systems in which we can live together well. And this would include uh, religious instructions, philosophical doctrines, the law, social institutions, practices, norms, habits. All of these things should be part of this massive, complex moral infrastructure that we are developing and repairing and updating and sometimes tearing down to help us to live well together. And that's something I'm very sympathetic to. I think that's a very good way of thinking about how our world is being constructed, partly because it motivates us to do the work to maintain this infrastructure and try to repair and expand it. What is a healthy kind of tearing down? You just mentioned that for the first time. Well, it's a, it's a feature of our imperfect history that a lot of the infrastructure that we put in place um, actually does very, very bad things. So, for example, uh, many of our laws were designed in times when our societies were much more racist and misogynistic than they are today, and they're still very misogynistic and racist. So in those cases, those structures actually do bad things, and they should be dismantled. For example, in many human societies, there are very oppressive expectations about how women ought to conduct themselves, how they ought to live, the sorts of interests that they ought to have, and these typically disadvantage women in all sorts of terrible ways those things should be dismantled. Because even if they were once introduced for good purposes, which is questionable, right now we recognize they're doing bad things. So that bit of the infrastructure, that needs to come down and it needs to be either replaced or redeveloped into something progressive. And it seems like there's different ways to have that piece come down, right? It's almost like that's what the law should be best suited towards. Like if you have developed a law that can be rewritten and easily rewritten, and you don't have too terrible corruptions within your legislative system, then you should be able to adjust those issues without sort of burning the place to the ground. Because I think... Well, the, uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I think that there is an ideal, I suppose, in most legal systems where they have mechanisms for the updating and revising the laws and enacting them properly. Uh, but in practice, um, things are much messier than that. What do you mean? Like civil war, slavery, ending of slavery in the United States, perhaps? Or... Like it's just much more difficult to do that than some noble thing that happens at the, at the judicial bench where people in robes make really good decisions and everything's okay on the far side? Yes. I think there, there are limitations within systems of laws themselves. For example, they usually contain ambiguities and they have to be interpreted. Therefore, much depends upon who's interpreting them. Um, much will depend, for example, on you know, who the judge is in the case. And in other cases, um, even when the laws are in place and they're well-defined, they don't always get equally enforced. Um, so, for example, in many human societies, if you have enough power or money or authority, you exist in a state where the laws don't really apply to you. Um, you mm. can use your power to avoid punishment and censure. Interesting. And do you think that that is secretly what individual humans aspire towards? Being to in that position. What was that? To, to a state of power, kind of powerful invulnerability. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I can imagine that many human beings, if they're honest, feel the temptations. Because I think one of the things that drives our vices is a sort of egoism. Because even when people recognize the importance of moral and social rules and norms, they will still sometimes chafe against them and feel themselves to be constrained. And in those cases, I think people will feel a temptation to have that power to just ignore or set aside those rules when it suits them. Now, that's one thing that I think many people struggle against. Because at the same time, people recognize that those moral rules and norms have important roles and functions but there still experiences constraints or as limits that sometimes we will resent. And that's why an important part of being a moral person is being very honest about your attitudes and your psychology, rather than pretending that you're some perfectly noble creature. Mm. Very few of us have one of those. The transparency is not particularly popular among humans, it seems like. 
it's extremely difficult to get people to be extremely honest and transparent about who they are, um, especially to themselves. Partly because if you have any serious moral sensibility, you'll recognize that there are aspects of your, your belief, your conduct, your past life, your present life that you would be uh, morally critical of. Everybody has vices and failings. Everybody will have done bad things. They might be minor, they might be major. Everybody knows that they have bad habits. And that's why it's very, very difficult to be transparent, to look within yourself and be honest and open about your failings. It's very, very difficult to do that. And to um, still keep loving yourself enough to take care of who you are in the future, I imagine. There can be a, there can be, there can be a sort of a self-regard of that sort of self-love sort, I suppose, yes, where you recognize that the only way that you will fundamentally get better as a person is to be honest, in which case honesty and self-love and self-interest come together quite nicely. Hmm. But still, there's a real pain to being honest about your failings in that way. At least in my experience, I find it easier to be honest about my own failings and moral limitations in the company of extremely close friends, because it's easier to surrender your vulnerabilities in context of trust. Hmm. And there are a few people in the world I do trust enough with my vulnerabilities in that sense, and they help me to get better. I can't wait to get to Earth and make some friends. We'll, we'll make it, eventually. Do you have anything to ask us about Alba Floss? Well, I, I'm wondering if there are misanthropes on your planet, or whether there could even be misanthropes, or whether you are actually the morally wonderful creatures that we've been waiting for. There used to be a lot more misanthropes. So, back before we moved Alba... We had to move Alba Floss at some point. Our sun was going out. And so it was this whole difficult thing, 500 years in the darkness, we found another sun. But when we came back, we had to really recreate the entire biome on the surface. And we had to be incredibly careful about the ways and the patterns that we brought back. And it was so much work that every single bacterium was sort of appreciated. And there's been less misanthropy since then because, or Miss Alva Flossy <laughs> since then, because we've just been focused on these questions of how the whole fits together and that we have a distinct need to take care of that whole. And it seems like humans, if you started to be more caretakers of the earth rather than just inhabitants of the earth, that might address some of the misanthropy problems. On Alba Floss, even our physics, every single piece of our understanding comes down to an interconnected understanding. So we don't see the trees as necessarily distinct from ourselves. In fact, we wouldn't be able to breathe without them, so we couldn't exist without them. So we don't really see ourselves as existing separately. It's really taken a long time. That's very interesting. So it was, it was an emergency. It was a, a genuine global crisis that made you all collectively realize the need to really kind of move up a few gears in moral terms. But it was a real end of the planet crisis. And it was an opportunity for us to consider the fact that without us, the planet would have died. And humans seem like they're coming to that point as well because you're starting to move off the planet. And if you move off the planet and you actually create an effective backup hard drive, so to speak, where you have animals on Mars or animals on different planets, seed stocks, then you actually become stewards of the planet in a way that you never have been before. The only interplanetary species ensuring that life continues. That's interesting because what, when, when human beings are debating um, space travel between planets within our solar system, because our technology is not so good yet, one of the arguments people give for not going to other planets and colonizing them is that until we can live properly on this planet and take care of this one, we shouldn't really be going to any other planets. And it's interesting the idea that actually um, moving outwards into the stars in that sense could actually drive people to transform themselves as a whole. So that was, I suppose, part of the vision of Star Trek. So in that television series, it was actually meeting an extraterrestrial race called the Vulcans, 
which really provoked human beings to come together. The awareness hmm. that we are not alone in the world. And if we're going to take our place on the intergalactic stage, we really need to be stage ready, morally speaking. Exactly. Yeah. So I hope that you I hope that you fare better than you have in the past, Dr. Kidd, in terms of these human problems. I genuinely do hope that we get better over time. I think that if but I think if people are going to get better, they need misanthropy because without a proper diagnosis of the nature and extent of a problem, you're never going to be able to overcome it. And one thing that's guaranteed to make for a bad future is dogmatic optimism. Things won't get better just because. They'll only get better if we are honest, disciplined, and give a true account of our current moral situation. And if the misanthrop is right, we've got a lot of work to do. But the misanthrop of my sort, anyway, does want people to do the work. It's not a council of despair. It's saying we need to be honest about what we're like if we're going to become better as time goes on. And hopefully by the time that you arrive here, we'll be in a good state for, for uh, conversations and friendship. Excellent. I love it. Well, it seems like a little bit of misanthropy goes a long way. That's the hope. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. So much. Kidd. Safe travels. Bye. Take care.